Hi, this is Gina with Resplendent Daughter Ministries. Thanks for stopping by today. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your great, great love for us. Thank you for showing us how we need to deal with conflict when we experience it in our lives. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts today to what you have for us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, how do you deal with conflict? What is your conflict style? It's impossible for us to live our lives without at some time or another encountering some kind of conflict. How do you handle it? If you're a Christian, does your faith affect how you deal with it? Are you a turtle, an owl, a fox, a shark? Grab your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians 4, verses 1 through 7. That's our passage for today, and I'm not going to take the time to read it to you, but just in synopsis as you're turning there, you're going to find that there are two ladies in the Philippian church. They're believers. They have worked to advance the gospel, but they're having some sort of disagreement, and it is such a disagreement that it has come to Paul's attention, and he gives some admonitions for how to deal with that, for how to resolve that conflict. Conflict will arise in the best of situations, in loving marriages, in a loving family, in a loving church, in a job situation that you absolutely adore into any situation into which you pour yourself. Anything that is your joy and your crown, as Paul described the Philippian church in the early verses of Philippians 4. So how did Paul deal with this conflict? He felt compelled to intervene. What did he say? Well, first of all, he reminded the Philippians of their supreme worth, not only to him as their spiritual father, but also to each other. He calls the Philippians his dear friends and his brothers and sisters. When we have disagreements with other believers or with non-believers, our tendency is to alienate ourselves from each other, to run the other way. But Paul here is admonishing his dear ones to draw closer together in their conflict. Now, why is he doing that? Why is he uh, encouraging them to bind themselves closer to each other? Well, the goal is to find agreement and it's hard to do that when one party has run away. Doing so is impossible also if one of the parties will do anything that it takes to win. In either case, those are the wrong approaches. In verse 2, Paul begs these two women to agree in the Lord. What does that mean? It means that each of their competing opinions must be held up to the standard of the Word of God, and that the Lord must govern their agreement. Godly agreement is based on both selflessness and truthfulness. Selfishness, lies, and deception are tools of the devil. They never lead to godly resolutions of conflict. Sometimes, number three, Outside wisdom is needed. There are times when dear ones are so entrenched in their beliefs and in their own positions that they present they prevent themselves from seeing a solution when it's apparent to someone else. In verse 3, Paul appeals to a fellow brother to help these two ladies find a way through their conflict. These types of situations often arise 
because the two or more parties have already ignored each other's wants and needs and viewpoints. And this continues until it's a full-blown conflict with the two sides becoming more and more blind to the opposing side's perspective and to again to possible resolutions of the conflict an intermediary is needed to help one or both sides say oh i see a possible solution now number four the importance of reasonableness is mentioned in verse five the word gentleness is also translated as graciousness or reasonableness in other translations Agreement does not mean that one side gives up, that's the turtle response, or that the other side burns it down in order to be right. That's the shark response. Number five, the centrality of earnest prayer to counteract anxiety and to lead to peaceful solutions. I'm not talking about the type of prayer that is prayed to sway opinions. You've probably, like me, heard people pray in public, and through their prayer, they're lecturing people or admonishing them or trying to sway them to their point of view. I believe that the admonition in verse 6 is, first of all, for personal, private prayer about the conflict, and then for one-on-one -on -one or very small group prayer in order to draw closer to God, to align our requests more closely with His will, and to thereby hear more clearly the hearts of our brothers and sisters. Number six, the importance of rejoicing in all things. This is a separate post in and of itself, but rejoicing in conflict is not my idea of a good time. Mm -mm, not at all all. However, when we realize that God uses all things to conform us to the image of his son, we can even embrace conflict. Rejoicing in all things brings peace, that supernatural peace that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, we must not run from conflict in our most precious relationships. I discovered a little tool yesterday morning that you might find interesting. It's not a perfect tool for a Christian because it doesn't take into consideration the Word of God or the moving of the Holy Spirit and the resolving of our conflicts. But it is an instructive tool to show each of us how we tend to handle conflict. I've put the link in my written blog post from which this vlog is made and you can find it if you look down in the YouTube description you can find my blog post link and go there and look at the tool but before we close let's let's consider this one point that the website makes because it's a very important one no one style of handling conflict or resolving conflict is always appropriate in every situation at all times. I had a supervisor once who was training me for his job. He said, Gina, always ask yourself, is it a mountain worth dying on? And that's a very good question here. Note these examples from parenting. Number one, your child gets dressed for school, comes downstairs, does not have on the clothes that you deem are just so. The entire look is modern, but not immodest. You resolve the conflict in your cognitive dissonance in your head, more in the line of the um, teddy bear response, because it's not a mountain worth dying on, okay? Number two, your child gets into the car with you and does not buckle his or her seatbelt. Red alert, red alert, you refuse to move the car until he buckles up. That's the shark response, and it's entirely appropriate in this situation because his safety in the car is a mountain worth dying on. Again, love grounded in truth is the standard. So there are times when it's appropriate to use one conflict resolution strategy over another. 
If, though, we treat each other as our joy and our crown, our relationships can survive our conflicts and become stronger for having made it through them. Let's close in prayer. Father, please forgive me for when I've chosen the wrong approach to resolving conflicts in my life and give me the wisdom to choose the right approach in the inevitable conflicts which arise so that love and truth will reign. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, thank you for being with me today here at Resplendent Daughter Blog. You see my Twitter handle at the bottom of the screen. You can comment on my vlog here um, at my Twitter handle on Twitter, or you can drop by and leave comments on my written blog. That address is at the top of the screen. If you enjoyed and were blessed by this vlog today, you can see more of them at this YouTube channel. I hope you'll subscribe.